first time she's really sat with me at a con and she said man i don't know if it's like if it's ottawa or if it's you or if it's magic but like all these people are amazing and um We love having you, man. It made me feel really good about being here. We're going to have some questions coming to me over here, but uh, because I am, uh, I, I like to think in my house between me and my two cats, I'm the biggest Wheaton fan. Yeah. My second cat comes in really close, though. Uh huh. Sure. And tabletop, amazing game. Now, I, I like to personally think that the holy trinity of internet nerddom is yourself. Felicia Day, of course, and uh, Chris Hardwick, I think. Yeah, I think that's amazing. I think that's right. Yeah, right. Who, who, which of you guys really is the bigger nerd? In the no, best possible way. Well, see, here's the thing, and I, there's a video of me uh, going around the internet right right now where I'm saying what I'm about to say in a slightly different version. Being a nerd is not about what you love. Being a nerd is about how you love it. So you can be a nerd for like video editing. You can be a nerd for lacrosse. You can be a nerd for knitting. You can be a nerd for storytelling. You can be a nerd for cosplay. You can be a nerd for Firefly. You can be a nerd for Star Trek. You can be a nerd for role playing games. It doesn't matter what you are a nerd for. Being a nerd means I love this thing. I love it unironically. I love it passionately. I love it without shame. And I find other people who love the same thing that I love and we love it together. So of the three of us, we all kind of love different things, but we're all really passionate about them. I'd say the place where Felicia Hardwick and I overlap mostly is in um, our, our just like incredible, incredible love for me. <laughs> and, 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 our just, and, and our passionate admiration of, uh, of, of how awesome I am. <laughs> Relaxing, but. <laughs> but but also um, in, in our our belief that uh, you should get excited and make a thing, and and that this is an amazing time to be alive. This is an incredible time to be a creative person. Maybe one of the best times in history to be a creative person because of the availability of technology uh, and, and the the just the tools that exist now to take that thing in your head, turn it into a physical object in front of you, and then how easily you can get that to other people who might want to share that thing with you. And that's sort of what I think all three of us are trying to do in our own way with our own uh, channels and our own, our, our own uh, interactions on the internet is uh, encourage people to get excited and make things and uh, don't be afraid to be a nerd about a thing. I don't think you have to say that to these people. <laughs> You have the bridge. 
Thank you. Um, before we get to the uh, uh, Q&A portion of our uh, unfortunately brief time together today, because I have to get on an airplane for a hopefully uh, more uneventful trip home than the one I had getting here, eat my ass United Airlines. recall for you this uh, this thing that happened last night um, so <laughs> I left the uh, we, we left we left the show yesterday evening and I fell asleep in the car on the way back to our hotel downtown and we had, there were, we had, had plans to go uh, my wife and I were gonna go to dinner with Felicia and Jewel State and her friends Cindy and uh, Nathan Fillion and his brother Jeff and we ended up picking up uh, Kevin Sorbo and Beck McNolan, a couple of people, and uh, we were, uh, as I got to the hotel, I said to my wife, I don't think I can do dinner, I'm so tired, I'm just going to go to sleep. And Anne and Felicia looked at me like, the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> you realize we're going to dinner with Nathan Fillion. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know, but I need a nap. So I took like a 20 minute power nap. Uh, and said that I was asleep the entire time on the back, on my back in the hotel uh, bed, uh, mouth open, drooling, you know, one leg occasionally kicking. I was sort of like a sleeping bird, a human version of our dog when it happens, <laughs> chasing birds in my sleep. And uh, and I and I, I, I get up and and uh, I feel you know like I feel like only like kind of like ass. But <laughs> but we went to dinner together and uh, and we had a really wonderful meal. And uh, at one point during dinner, um, Nathan starts telling the story about how one of his uh, one of his friend's dogs ate a, a cassette tape. Uh, now, kids, cassette tapes are from the before times. You can think of a cassette tape as a very, very, very low, small capacity like flash drive. Um, that actually has to play on a device that's two and a half times the size of the actual physical media. And it used tape, like imagine, you know, tape, right? Um, magnetic tape. So the dog eats tape, and Nathan is describing how his friend now is walking the dog, and the dog goes to poop, and some tape comes out. And he has to pull, and he starts pulling the tape. And the tape just keeps on coming. Like, I mean, it's probably a 90 minute tape. Just like he's yeah. so it's gonna be okay, buddy. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. And Felicia, who's sitting between us, says, "You know, Nathan, you shouldn't pull the tape out of the dog's ass that fast because it could upset its intestines." And Nathan goes, "What?" <laughs> and continues to pull imaginary tape out of the imaginary dog's ass. Slowly to protect the dog. So eventually he got it all out, he cleaned it up, had a lot, a lot of fun explaining that to the server. And uh, there was a, a couple of tables over, a, uh, a, a table full of, of, of people. And uh, a gentleman came over to me and he said, uh, as we we're finished up our meal, he said, excuse me, um, I'm a huge fan of, of the Big Bang Theory and uh, my, uh, my wife and our sister are having dinner with us and uh, they're huge fans of the Big Bang Theory and I wonder if maybe we could take a picture together so uh, you could, you know, we could show the picture to our kids. And, and I said, I, yeah, I'd be really happy to do that. And, uh, and he took out his cell phone and he hands it to Nathan and says, would you take the picture of us? Nathan's a very good photographer, he'd be happy to do that. <laughs> so, he takes, so he takes the picture, the guy walks away, I sit back, I sit back down, and uh, I'm finishing up and have a little whiskey after dinner, and I sip my whiskey and I say, hey, does that, you guys remember that time we were at the restaurant? <laughs> and uh, those guys came over and they asked Nathan to take our picture together. <laughs> Nathan picks up his drink and he goes, nobody remembers that well. <laughs> Nobody remembers that story. Oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> he gets up and leaves. He 
comes back slightly too long for the amount of time it takes a person to go to the bathroom later. And he comes back and with all this mock desperation says, oh you guys, I would have been back sooner, but there was like a table of Firefly fans. And you know, I just had to sit down and talk to all of them. And I was like, oh really? Where? Oh no, they left. They had, they had to go. They had to get out. So it was a good night. I'm really tired today and it's completely worth it. <laughs> you do cheerleading in Canada? No. It's like, apparently you do. I won't tell you the story about the cheerleading mom. Uh, does anybody Canada remember the great canned pumpkin shortage of 2009? Woo! <laughs> because I recently had to clear out my pantry and apparently I was stocking up okay, just in case. <laughs> and I guess in like 2007, kidney beans were going to be kind of the new international currency. <laughs> Because I had a lot of those in the pantry as well, like 11 cans. I don't even know what you use canned pumpkin for that much. I mean, pie! Like, you make it, you like, use it to make pie, but you don't make that many pies. Says you. Like, you make two pumpkin pies, you serve one at dinner, you put the other one in the refrigerator, then for the next however many days worth of pie you have in there, you love and hate yourself at breakfast <laughs> and you eat it, and then you're done, and that's like one can of pumpkin, like, I don't know what I was doing with two dozen cans of pumpkin, but it was a thing that I need, and the reason that I found this pumpkin was because uh, there was one pantry pest, not even in the closet, like in the kitchen, and the pantry pests are these little bugs with like little powdery wings and uh, and they just fly around and they're gross and they lay their larva in like your oatmeal and your quinoa and, and, then, and not they do not get into cans of pumpkin. That, maybe because they're expired, I don't know. And uh, my wife, who I love, who is the most amazing human in the world and my favorite, the best part of my life, uh, I do not know how she managed to t-shirt cannon two human beings out of herself into the world um, because she is mortified by bugs. <laughs> like really, like you saw like all of like they took your intestines out of your body so that a baby could come out of you and you're fine with that. But a bug that is smaller than the average googly eye like gets this. <laughs> So I had to clean out the entire pantry and I found those things. It is weird having a pantry with a lot of space in it. I don't know what to stock up on. I don't trust Art Bell anymore, that's for sure. Uh, so um, I want to tell you one last thing that, uh, that recently happened to me, uh, and then I would like to take your, uh, your questions. Um, I discovered recently that I have a secret admirer. <laughs> It's awesome. It's a little weird. It's a little creepy. Because this particular secret admirer was like buying me things. Like lots of gifts were showing up at my house. Um, yeah, but they were awesome so I didn't want to send them back. So I started to get like... Um, I, I would like I would hear a, an, an old like an old yes song or something like that, and then a couple of days later, uh, the entire yes discography would show up from Amazon at my house. That was a little weird. That was a little excessive. Or uh, I, I was like I I would see uh, an, an old uh, movie or something, and then like the director's Blu-ray Criterion edition of that uh, movie that I didn't even really want to watch, but I had just kind of heard about like that would show up. And then like toys and things, like stuff that I always wanted as a kid were, were arriving from eBay. And it kind of started to freak us out a little bit. Like we were like, we, we be, my Anna and I began to feel a little strange about this. Uh, uh, and what really put us over the top was when um, uh, one of those Archie McPhee horse masks 
<laughs> uh, unsolicited in the mail. Uh, at, at which point, my wife said, Oh, your secret admirer is drunk you. <laughs> And it made like it made a lot of sense. Like suddenly, all the notes around the house came in. Like the note on the the note like on the dining room table that just says in all capital letters, "Billy Ocean." <laughs> I get that. I know what that means now. I mean, I don't know what it means, but I know why it's there. Okay. I understand why I suddenly got uh, a subscription to the Poutine of the Month Club. <laughs> There was a drawing that was like kind of like angry drawing that wasn't really decipherable and then underneath it in equally angry writing it said monkey on a tree monkey in a tree what the fuck same difference <laughs> and i was like someone left me fan art no nope, drunk me <laughs> so um ann and i had a talk and she was like it's time for you to end it with drunk you like this i am not comfortable with this relationship and i was like well how about a three-way with drunk me? <laughs> that went over about as well as you would expect. So, I told drunk me I had to break it off. I had to end it. Yeah. Drunk me did not take it well. <laughs> drunk me sent me uh, a Taylor Swift record from iTunes. <laughs> I'm thinking that I might just sort of like string them along a little bit for a little while. Like just until the PS4 comes out. But then it's over for sure. Then I am walking away from it. Because I am not a whore. All the time. to entertain your questions should you have any it looks like we have roughly uh, a half an hour in which to to accomplish this interrogation <laughs> uh begin sir hello, hello mr Wheaton. hi my name is dean we're quite honored to have you here in ottawa thank you <laughs> your city has been really really nice to me it always <laughs> is send the rest of your star trek friends <laughs> what's in it for me <laughs> Two-part question for you. All right. You often hear about how well the cast of Star Trek: the Next Generation gets along. Yes. I was uh, always wondering, given the age difference between you and the rest of the cast, did you feel included in that as well, or is it sort of like, well, you know, time to hang with the teenager? Uh, I felt included in it to an extent. Um, there were, you know, one of the really wonderful things about being the kid in the in the bridge of the Next Generation is that I had nine parents, <laughs> and when I was young, when I was like 14, that sucked. <laughs> but as I got older. It was actually good because these were nine people with nine different points of view who I could get advice from and and who could guide me and and sort of kick my ass a little bit when that needed to happen. There was a, a special relationship that existed with everyone in the cast that I didn't even have with my own parents. One of the real causes of, of angst for me uh, sort of goes to your question. Like I really wanted to hang out. I really wanted to be friends. I wanted to be funny like LeVar and cool like Frakes and, and like as talented, as multi-talented as Brent and just like, I, I just couldn't get there, you know, just because, because of our age difference. And, and it was even more frustrating for me because we were uh, on the set we were uh, peers, and we were able to work together, and, and, and like that was awesome. Um, but as soon as we were done with work, they were adults and I was a kid. And I always wished that uh, Wesley Crusher had experienced some of the same existential dread and angst that I experienced as, as an actor. Because uh, I imagine he was in very much the same situation, right? That he and Jordy can hang out when, you know, when they're rock and engineering. Uh, but when it's time to go to do other things, and he's like, hey, let's go play video games in the holodeck. And Jordy's like, nope, I'm going to 10 Ford. <laughs> the grown-ups. Quick follow-up question. Was there ever any conflict between the main actors on the set? No. 
No, there never was, and and uh, and and there hasn't ever been. I mean, it's sort of it's sort of legendary in uh, in in the entertainment industry that the cast of Next Generation uh, loved and continues to love each other like pretty much like no other. Thank you very much. Thanks sir. for your question. Hi, I'm Sari. Uh, first, I have an apology. All right. When I went to see Toy Soldiers in the store, in the uh, movie theater, yeah, and you got gunned down, I actually stood up and cheered. <laughs> and I feel bad now, 22 years later. Well, I mean, there was a lot to cheer. Like, you weren't going to have to hear that bad accent anymore. <laughs> the dangly on hearing was pretty much gone for the rest of the movie. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you weren't going to have to uh, endure um, all of the graffiti on my pants. So, I mean, I, yeah, I, 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 I think you get a pass on that one. I felt awkward. I was the only person in the theater who actually cheered because I was the only one to watch Star Trek. So. But my oh, wait a minute. You projected... <laughs> you, you, so what you're saying is you, you projected... You projected those Jealousy. strange feelings for Wesley Crusher on to Joey, who, who through no fault of his own, it wasn't enough that Joey suffered by not having a relationship with his mafia boss father, and it wasn't enough that Joey had to be in a school full of terrorists, and it wasn't enough that his, that his accent, which the actor who portrayed him specifically said he did not want to do because he was worried he would sound like Corey boys <laughs> all of those things weren't enough that when he was so happy to finally have a machine gun because Billy with a machine gun we could shred these motherfuckers <laughs> because finally and he was shot down and get on the step and you cheered because of something that had nothing to do with him good day sir My name is Richie, it's really nice to meet you, and uh, I wanted to ask you what it's like to play, I'm assuming, fictionalized, like, jerk version of yourself on the Big Bang Theory. It's amazing. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, I'm going to say not fictionalized. It, it was... <laughs> For those of you who didn't hear it, he said, I'm going to say not fictionalized. I, uh, I love playing that character, and it's been really fun figuring out who he is. Uh, coming off of Fox in the Guild and Dr. Parrish on Eureka and Chaos on, uh, on Leverage, uh, it was important to me that those characters who are, are like sort of douchey and sinister in their own way did not bleed into the delightfully evil sort of uh, sitcom version of, of that sort of character's point of view. And I was talking with Bill Prady, the, uh, the co-creator and, and showrunner, and uh, Bill said, look, the villain is the hero of his own story. So justify why Evil Will Wheaton likes to mess with Sheldon so much, and I decided that Evil Will Wheaton is just, he's just a troll. <laughs> And it's so, like, Felicia Day, who I adore, who is one of my best friends in the world, she and I have this terrific relationship uh, where I'm kind of constantly trolling her in real life because she <laughs> always goes for it. Just, just always. And it's fun and it's silly. And I imagine that Evil Will Wheaton has the same relationship with Sheldon. He's just, he doesn't have to do much of anything. It's just, Sheldon just, he's just like, here, um, look at that. And, Sheldon just goes bananas over a thing, and you know, people will just sits back and enjoys it. Um, and uh, and I think it's also very important for everyone to understand that um, Evil Will Wheaton is not good at bowling. <laughs> but just like Kirk in the Kobayashi Maru, he found a way to win. Thank you very much for that. You were five! <laughs> I said good day!
<laughs> I, I'll agree with him, I did shed a tear when Joey Trotter went down. But um, my question is more around um, stand, stand By Me. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> what fun stories in regards to that? The summer that we shot Stand By Me is the summer that Back to the Future came out. And uh, we were shooting up in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, it was 1985. And we all knew that we were working on a movie that was special. None of us knew that we were working on a movie that was going to become what Stand By Me became. Um, but it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I learned a lot as an actor. And I still draw a lot on the experience that I, that I got working on that film. Um, because the performances are all very specific, but they're all very simple. And uh, it's a thing that, that I think one of the reasons that the film does so well is that Rob Reiner cast four guys who were basically those characters. They were, um, uh, you know, Corey was like just so angry and in so much pain and, and like had, had just did not have anything going on in his family. And River was was trying so hard to sort of like take care of everybody and, and be kind of like like a calming leader and influence on, on everyone. And Jerry was just hilarious and, and just like and had this wonderful sense of self. Uh, the self-deprecating sense of himself, and and I was weird and unsure of myself, and uh, and awkward, and and trying really hard to figure out who I was and why I was. And Rob just took all of us and put the like matched us up with those characters, and then just sort of pushed us right. And it's like I'm in Canada. I'll use a curling metaphor. It's like it's like I'm the Rock, okay, and he's the Skip. And, uh, and he's just got to get me into the house. <laughs> Every now and then, if I'm going one way, you know, if I'm going one way, if I'm, if I'm veering off uh, course, it's just a little gentle sweeping to, to, to put me back in without upsetting things too much. And I learned a lot about that, and there's a lot to be said about being an actor. Like, it, it helped me learn to trust my instincts, to not overly complicate things, and that, you know, when you're acting, it doesn't necessarily need to feel like you're acting. If I feel like I'm acting, it means I look like I'm acting, and I need to feel like I'm just genuinely experiencing whatever's going on with that character. Uh, but it was an incredible experience. It was really, really fun. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly proud and grateful uh, that for the rest of my life I get to stand on the shoulders of that film. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm sure you know where this question is going, but... Uh, I can assure you I have no idea. <laughs> is this going to be about how you stood up and cheered when my character Ted McCord and the Batman and Brave and the Bold series turned out to have been killed and actually not living on Science Island because you didn't like Wesley Crusher? <laughs> I was wondering, uh, now that you've been to Ottawa, if the next time you're on Fun With Legs, you could do this one. And what would you say? I have to tell you, being on Fun With Legs was so much fun. Um, with flags, and there was, there's this moment that happened that I think I'm the only person in the world who actually saw this happen. It wasn't, would it be on the screen? It'll never be on the screen. No one in the audience really noticed it. Maya, Maya Bialik is a masterful comedian. She's, she is, she's phenomenal. She is, she's like a jazz musician with, with comedy. So comedy is all about rhythm and, uh, and delivery. Uh, there's there are certain tricks to comedy where you take a little turn. There are things that are unexpected, and and, and there's this very careful uh, blending of the tension between what the audience expects and what we don't see coming, and and satisfying and surprising. But it all has to go in a very specific, uh, almost like almost like a five seven time. Like the, and some characters are like right on the downbeat. But then there's some characters, like Amy Farrah Fowler, who are a, a downbeat and an upbeat behind, right? And if you watch it, you can see that, that Maya is always like just a little bit behind the beat, but she's completely in the rhythm of what's going on. That is so unbelievably hard to do, because it goes against your comedic actor instincts 
to uh, like just stay on there and keep like keep the laugh going, like let it settle and then like kick it up again. And she's so good at that, and I just love working with her. But she makes these character commitments to Amy that uh, that I wasn't aware of until that particular episode. So she's back behind the camera, right, filming uh, Sheldon and, and Eva Will Wheaton, and she's back like with her hand on the thing, and then she's a first time director, and uh, Sheldon is is reading these things, and it's really important to Amy that that this goes over well, right? So we're gonna open, it's a cold open, it opens on the monitor shot of, of him, which actually comes from a camera, that that, act, that video camera she's holding isn't plugged in, but it comes from like an actual camera that's off a little bit. So we're not looking at Amy's camera, we're looking like a little bit to the side. And the way it looks on TV is that we're looking straight into the camera. So Jim is talking and he's, and he's doing his bit into the camera and, and Amy, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Maya, because Amy is behind him with her hand on the camera and she's nodding along with what he's doing and then mouthing the words that he's saying, which is something that a first time nervous director does because it's like, I got to stay focused and welcome to Fun with Flags. Today was <laughs> and she's doing that and it's brilliant and it's hilarious and no one sees it but Mayim does that because it by the time the camera gets to Amy, Amy is alive because she's been existing in that scene the entire time. And it's a really great lesson for actors. Your character has a life off screen and things are happening and existing before you get on. So there are, there are times where you have to blow onto the stage and you're in the middle of a thing that's been happening off stage and it might not even be in the script and it's your job as an actor to figure out what that is. So that what is happening on stage has a history and makes sense. And uh, and I loved, I loved watching her do that. Uh, and the last thing, when we did that episode, and he says, so here's my friend, you know, for whatever, Will Wheaton, and, uh, and I come walking out, the audience in the theater at, the, at, at Warner Brothers goes, Whoa! Right? It was like, it was like Al Bundy comes through the living room doors <laughs> for 1988 on Mary the Children. And uh, my and the, my brain goes, dude, high five! <laughs> and I'm like, shut up, brain, we're at work. <laughs> Not a good time. <laughs> and I sit down and I do the scene, and then the you know, we we get through it and we cut, and I lead, I turn right to Jim and I go, did I just fuck that up completely? Because when I walked out, they went, woo! But I didn't know what to do about it, and I tried to just keep it. He was like, "No, you were fine. You been no, you were fine." And the director comes over and he goes, "That was awesome. We're just going to do a little tiny pickup." Audience, we had trouble with the sound, so if you could not woo when Will Wheaton comes out, and then I was like, "High five, brain." So thanks for your question. First of all, I just wanted to say that I was very sad that you're, uh, there wasn't more Will Wheaton in uh, Star Trek Nemesis. It was kind of sad that we didn't get to see more of you. It was nice that we got to see you in the deleted scenes. Yeah, thank you. And uh, my question is, uh, what's the story behind the uh, rainbow uniform in Star Trek Next Generation? And how did you feel about wearing it? So the rainbow stripe uniform, uh, uh, which, depending on, on what your point of view is, could be called the Fruit Strike Gum Uniform, or it could be called Wesley's Gay Pride Spacesuit. <laughs> the idea behind that is that he had received a field promotion, and uh, he hadn't attended the academy yet, and he was just an acting ensign without having been assigned to a particular department. So, the three colors, it's one color from each branch of Starfleet, and it represents that he has not yet chosen where he's going to go and, and, and what he's what he's going to do. And I really liked it. I thought it was really cool. I really I liked that spacesuit a lot. Um, and then the, the following season they uh, they got him out of that particular spacesuit and put him into the ugly gray spacesuit that I hated. I really hated that. I hate I hated that so much. It was I it was that the, that spacesuit um, I called it the Iron Maiden because it was very, it was very tight. 
Um, it was all about camel toes, um, and, and it was made entirely out of wool, and I had to wear a muscle suit underneath it. So I felt really awkward and weird and uncomfortable in it, and I didn't like it. Um, but that did actually make, by the time I got to wear a real spacesuit that you could do the Picard maneuver on, um, that was pretty awesome. Thank you very much. A friend of mine knows how much I love Wesley's rainbow stripes uh, spacesuit uniform. So she, uh, for a, a, a birthday a few years ago, she, she bought a Wesley uh, Crusher action figure, and she took it out of the package, and she painted it. So she repainted the whole thing and painted that spacesuit onto him, and, uh, and then put acting Ensign Wesley Crusher into the, the artwork of the thing, and then glued it back up and gave it to me as a birthday present. And I have it right It's great. I want to start by saying thank you for rekindle, rekindling my, my wife and my love of tabletop games. Oh, I'm very happy. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'm so proud of tabletop. Um, my question was, are we going to hear anything more from Acquisitions Incorporated in the future? And is Penny our on tabletop? Um, you will probably hear from Acquisitions this summer. Um, I know that they're, I suspect they're planning to do another game at PAX Prime. I won't be in it because I'll be at Dragon Con. I'm, uh, I'm not going to be at PAX Prime this year. Uh, I have already had Mike and Jerry come down to play uh, Shadows Over Camelot. Uh, it was Tara Strong, Jerry, Mike, and me playing Shadows Over Camelot. Uh, and it's on this season of Tabletop, and I just don't remember where it is in the release schedule. Well, look forward to watching that. <laughs> yeah, it was really a lot of fun. And if you like those, those uh, the, the role-playing shows that we did on Tabletop, if you like Fiasco, if you like Woo! Dragon Age, um, and, and, and if you like the podcast that I did with uh, Penny Arcade, I am working on developing a spin-off series, a Tabletop spin-off series, that will be, it's just the Tabletop RPG show. And it would be one full season, one campaign, the same characters. Uh, <laughs> tell you how happy I am to hear that, man, because, because it's a thing that I've wanted to do since the first day of Tabletop, and I just didn't know if the audience was there, so we sort of, we tried it with, like, like ta uh, a Dragon Age and Fiasco were sort of, like, um, tests for that to see if we could do that kind of storytelling, so at the moment, I am, uh, I am, I'm playtesting a couple of different systems, and, uh, and, and, and I've already talked to a few players, and I have commitments from a few really cool people to come and play on the show. Uh, so hopefully, if we can, uh, if we can get the show funded, and, uh, and we can, we figure out that we can make it work, then that would be something that I would, I would, I would I'm thinking about it. Um, uh, then that would be something that we would look into maybe producing later this year. Well, we'd love to see a GURPS year. campaign on there, so. Thanks, yeah. I, well, you know, GURPS is a wonderful system, and it's a campaign that I steal a lot from for whatever campaign I'm playing in, because it's so easy to take stats out of it and then just turn things into other, uh, other things. No, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, I'm a big fan of uh, Tabletop, and uh, because of Thank your you. show, my sister actually bought uh, Catan uh, Star Trek Edition. Yes. And we played it last Friday night before coming to uh, Comic-Con. Yes. And uh, I want to ask a question. It's pretty philosophical, and, uh, and so I want to hear your opinion on it. Who's your favorite pony? Sparkle. <laughs> because that's the character my friend Tara does. So that's. Please don't have any follow up questions. Thank you very much. Uh, young lady in the second row, are you Sparks McGee? Would you stand up, please? Would you come to the stage, please? Can I, can I help you get up here somehow? Do you mind modeling this for the for the for the kids in the audience? There's there's a non-canonical Star Trek character 
thank you. What's your name? Yeah. This is Mia, everybody. So there is a non-canonical Star Trek character called Sparks McGee. This is what Sparks McGee looks like. He wears a cowboy hat. Uh, he's Wesley Crusher's alter ego. The existence of Sparks McGee is so that Wesley could be cool. <laughs> been determined that Wesley would be cooler if uh, he had a cowboy hat and it drove a Trans Am. <laughs> and Picard would say things like, where the devil is that Sparks McGee? And then Riker would say, I wish I could be as cool as that Sparks McGee. That guy is one real rebel. Do you know Sparks McGee's catchphrase? Suck it, Picard. <laughs> How it's awesome to be a geek for things and how it's awesome to get excited and make things. I just put on my blog last year, this is the description of Sparks McGee. It would be awesome if there was Sparks McGee cosplay because that would make me happy. And at every con I go to, there's this awesome person cosplaying as Sparks McGee. It's about 80% female playing Sparks McGee, which is super great. Uh, I highly recommend that you go to the Tumblr, which is the adventures of uh, Sparks Media Adventures .tumblr.com. You're very likely going to be on there by the time uh, the week is out. And, uh, and learn more about the mythos of Sparks Media because the world needs more Sparks Media. I think I might cosplay as Sparks Media at a future con. <laughs> Yes. Hi there. Uh, I was kind of surprised to hear a little bit with your, your Q&A today just how fragile your ego is. I was kind of surprised to <laughs> someone who's such a successful actor Thank and you. writer and tabletop, you do it all. So you'll probably be... It's not often that a person who built an entire media empire from basically a GeoCities webpage uh, is able to uh, go on, uh, this is where I would list all my credits if I could remember them, uh, then this is where I would somehow find a way to make it funny, and then I would end it with, and you know, without really, without really having a giant ego. <laughs> being ironic, uh, and to which my wife would say, you know, you really came across as an ass in that <laughs> That bit didn't work at all. So perhaps it'll assuage your ego just a little bit that Thank you. this morning when we were here for, for Nathan Fillion, the first story he had to tell was the fact that he got upstaged by this Will Wheaton dude who got more recognition last night at the restaurant than he did. <laughs> Did the subject come up, and how long is it going to be before we see Will Wheaton guest starring on Castle, so that he can reestablish his uh, his glory? Honestly, I would absolutely love to do that. I would love to have Nathan on tabletop. Uh, Um, in the entertainment industry, it's it's not as easy as I want to do this, you want me to do that. There's you know a lot of things have to happen, and you know, a lot of, a, a, a lot of pegs have to line up before that lock opens, and uh, and it's not particularly easy. But Nathan and I have both talked about how we would very much like for uh, for for me to come in and be on his show, and that how much I'd like for him to be on mine. So thank you for for asking. Thank you. left before I go over, and I really can't go over today because uh, I do have an airplane to be on. So can you ask a lightning round question? All right, um, when you're playing D&D, do you have a story about the best critical hit, either a 20 or a 1? The, the, one of my favorite critical hit uh, situations ever was playing True Dungeon last year at Gen Con, and I, um, I, I got to the very last room, and there was a dragon, a big terrifying dragon, and I had a, I had a dragon lance, and if you managed to critical hit the dragon with the dragon lance, you could one-shot the dragon and kill it. One party of adventurers had survived the dragon, and we were one of the last ones to go through that weekend, and I got up there with the dragon, and uh, it was, uh, and, and I took I took my shot with the spear, and I lined it up, and I landed the spear into the heart of the dragon. I critical hit the dragon. I killed the dragon. Um, I one shot the dragon. I became 
one of two people who actually killed the dragon at Gen Con uh, that year, I guess it was 2010, one of two that actually killed the dragon, uh, then the guy that was rolling the die for the dragon gave me the die, because he was like, this is the dragon's heart, so you can have it. It's amazing. I have it, I have it mounted at home. Uh, the True Dungeon made a special rare token that's Will's Dragon Heart that gives you four extra hit points at the beginning of a game if you just possess Woo! it. It's really great. That was probably the best critical. Of the game. Well, everybody, before I go, go, go ahead, please. I just want to say one thing before I go, and this is really important. This is a thing that I've been telling my kids for their entire lives. And it's a thing that I try to tell uh, people who will listen to me um, because I think it's really, I think it's really important. Um, it's very important to me that uh, as you go through your life, you please live by the following rules. Be honest, be honorable, be kind, work hard because everything worth doing is hard. Do not ever give up when something you're doing is hard. Always do your best and know that what your best is is going to change from day to day and from minute to minute. Be awesome and don't be a dick. <laughs> Thank you.